All right, testing, testing. Can you hear me? All right. And hello to our folks on Zoom. I, don't, I apologize for being 5'3", so for those of you in the back, you probably won't be able to see me very well. That's the sklalom traits. All right, I see, I see a hand up there, so good. I'm glad you can see me. Well, uh, My name is Lonnie Grinnell Greninger. I'm from the Prince family here at the Jamestown Sklalom tribe. Our ancestral name is Statichlam Nuskayam, which means the strong and clever people, and we take that to heart. And so I'm just really glad to be here and hopefully invigorate you and inspire you with the words that I have for you tonight. I want to be able to share with you in about 15 or 20 minutes, hundreds and thousands of years of sacredness and our values of what, what marine life means to the New Sky am people. And so I have pictures on the slides for you tonight um, that I hope, you know, warm your hearts. So maybe you'll warm up a little here too, for those of you here in person. Uh, but I'm just really excited to share with you some of my cultural values because when we have a relationship with the land, and I'll talk about this partnership a little bit more as we get through this presentation tonight. When you have a relationship with the land, a relationship with the, with the animals, with the brothers and sisters of creation, it makes our work with them so much more deep, so much more connected. And so it makes that meaningfulness come out even more. And it allows us to feel very satisfied with the work that we do and the lives that we lead. So with that, I'm gonna put a timer on myself because I love to talk, and I don't even drink wine. <laughs> All right, there we go. So I have uh, started us off with a little bit of Nuskaimutsin, which is the Sklalom language. Can you all repeat that? Just kidding. Okay. <laughs> we gather with the water. All right. And so I want you to, if you can see this picture, it's, this is a picture of my grandfather, and he's feeding the eagles on Jamestown Beach. Uh, just, just to give a little bit of a preview into what does that mean, that connection with the water, water connecting species, water connecting creation, water connecting villages. So whenever I'm giving a community education speech, or a talk, a training, or anything like that, I want you to know a little bit about me. Because when you're able to connect with me, maybe you're able to connect with the material a little bit more and maybe find a place in your life where you relate really, really well. And so I, I usually, in, my, in our customs, we introduce ourselves by our ancestral lineage. And so what I'd tell you is, you know, who my father is, who my grandmother, my great-grandmother, all the way up as far as I can remember. And so in the ancestral lineage of the Nuskayam, we can go back pretty far, which is really amazing with our oral histories. And so the photo that you see on top, that is Chief Chichmahan, or Chief Chetsamoka, as most of you might know him. He was the chief of the Port Townsend area at our village called Katai. So that's where my family originates from, is Port Townsend. And then we were moved over here into the swim area um, as settlements were coming in. And so he was actually the first one in my family to encounter non-native settlers. He was able to be the first one to partner with them, unite with them, and coexist respectfully and responsibly with them. And those value systems of coexisting with the people around us, creation, humans, animals, all of that combined, that was so important to him. And I believe that those value systems actually are in my veins, passed down seven generations. So seven generations ago, we have Chief Chichmahan. And then now we have me, the manifestation of seven generations from him. He did all of this wonderful work, interacting, partnering, figuring life out, figuring out how to keep and maintain and sustain our natural resources, the beauty around us. He was able to pass down all of those value systems through those generations, and now I get to do that. I get to uphold those. And so I love being able to teach on these value systems because it's so important. So one of the things that we want to be able to say is we are co-managers, we are protectors, we love the creation. We were given a specific sacred duty from the creator to be able to steward these lands and these seas and the skies. And because of that sacred duty, we're very tied to the land. So being able to stay on our homelands is very important to the native peoples. I think anyone can, uh, can really relate to that. You know, if you have a home, you've settled there, you're connected to that place, right? You're connected to the land. It's been serving you. It's been pr providing for you. And then you work the land, and it, it's, there's a relationship there. So I think everyone can really identify with that, being connected to the place where you live, okay? 
And so when we are stewards of the land, there's this deal that's happening. It's this mutual partnership. When we invest in the land, it invests in us in return. And we have legends and myths that tell those types of stories. We have ceremonies that actually display those types of relationships. They're pretty neat, and I'll talk about a few of them as we go along here. All right, so what's my brief connection to uh, Furo Marine Life Center? I wanted to be able to share with you that I've actually interacted with the Marine Life Center since I was a kid. Uh, I had an elementary trip there, and I have a picture on the screen here of a sea cucumber because that was the first time I was able to touch one. And I loved it. And, you know, when I first looked at it, here I am in elementary school, so I'm probably like seven or eight years old. And I took a look at these sea cucumbers, and if you look at them, they look kind of scary, you, like you shouldn't touch them. And then it was part of the touch tank, and so they were like, no, 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 it's okay. And they would encourage me to touch it. And then you touch it's a squishy little blob of felt. I thought it was just the neatest thing. And, you know, you... As a, um, as a child of a commercial fisherman, my dad was a commercial fisherman, he would encounter all sorts of marine life. You know, he dove 30 feet into the water, he would harvest gooey duck, and he would bring up all sorts of creatures, you know, sea pens, different kelp, jellyfish, things like that. But I had never seen a sea cucumber, and so it was really neat for me to be able to touch one and not be afraid of it anymore. So I just have to thank Fiero for helping me with my fears of uh, sea life. <laughs> um, but then, as Melissa mentioned uh, a little bit beforehand, I was also to help with some equity, inclusion, diversity work and be able to do some educational videos sharing about our ceremonies around the salmon. And so it's just been really great to keep this connection alive and I'm really happy to be here tonight. So I just wanna orient us real quick on the land of the new I am. And so this map here, I do not expect you to read the, all the little tiny t uh, tags of text here, but every one of those tags is a known village site to the new I am. And you can see we were a water people. We were along the Strait of Juan de Fuca. We believed that our sustenance came from the waters. Of course, it came from the forests and the mountains as well, but we were a water people first and foremost. And so if I bring you to five, these five villages are where we are populated now. So you have, uh, let's see, Ethwa, so that's Elwa, so I'd say West Port Angeles, Chuitzen, which is Port Angeles proper, Schwing, which is what we call Squim, Statithlam, which is where Jamestown has its name, is around the Dungeness area. Katai is Port Townsend. And then Nukayet is the kingston Paulsbo area, and that's where the Port gamble Swalm tribe is located. And then, of course, Lower Elwar, our other sister tribe, is located in Port Angeles. So as you're thinking about the land and as you're hearing my stories tonight, this is the types of connections that we're talking about, these ancestral connections to the land where we were here going village to village, and we were going from season to season, moving along with the animals. We would follow them. So we were almost a nomadic people as well, but we also had permanent residences. Oh, there we go. So this photo here is me carrying the salmon for our salmon ceremony. And I'll explain a little bit more of this later, but when we talk about the indigenous perspective, we come back to that foundation of we're connected to the land, we're stewards, okay? And so we provide for them, they provide for us in return. And when we talk about the salmon ceremony or uh, other first foods ceremonies, we celebrate those particular animals who've given their lives up for us to be able to provide sustenance. We celebrate the foods that have grown from the earth, maybe grown from the trees, um, these animals that have grown from the waters, grown from the forests. Each one of them are worth celebrating because they gave up a life to be able to give our lives more sustenance and more health. And the marine life, is no different. Marine life provided so much for us from shellfish, urchins, sea cucumbers. Uh, gosh, we ate kelp. Kelp was one of our tools for cooking. Um, I even just learned the other day that kelp tubes were used for special effects and storytelling. You could like make sound effects with the t if you blow into the tubes, uh, which was pretty neat. So we, I just want to reiterate this sacredness theme as we're going through, if you're, as you're hearing my words tonight. So I have this beautiful picture of my grandmother, Elaine Grinnell, up here. She is our tribe's storyteller, and I will give her a small plug. If you end up uh, going on YouTube and if you type in ancestral stories of the Clallam people and her name, Elaine Grinnell, you'll find uh, some of her CD recordings on YouTube, and you can listen to our myths and legends. Uh, there's stories on there such as how the salmon got its hook nose. You know, there's uh, stories on there of creation, Moral lessons, you know, listen to your parents. If there are any kids here, listen to your parents. Even you adult kids, listen to your parents, right? Uh, 
So I, I definitely check it out. So you can get to know our people a little bit more through our stories and what we teach our children through storytelling. It's pretty neat. But when we're talking about the brothers and sisters of creation, we're not talking about what, but who. So when you're looking at the ocean, it's not a what is the ocean, but more of a who is the ocean and who is living underneath its waters. So we have stories, myths, legends of the orca villages, the salmon villages, the seal people. And in fact, some of these uh, villagers who are underwater, they would come onto the shores and they would shape shift and then be among us. Sometimes we even hear of stories of intermarriage between humans and these other villages. So we would have women who would marry killer whale men, and they would go back and forth between these villages visiting their families. And when we had these intermarriages, it also formed a stronger bond and relationship of provision. So we were able to show that we treated these animals with kindness, and they would go back to their villages and say, yes, the Nuskayim were good to us. We can continue to interact with them. These happened with the forest animals as well. But since we're focusing on marine life tonight, I wanted to be able to highlight that. We're not talking about what, but who. We have all of these different villages in our waters. When Melissa gave me this theme of water connecting us all, I was like, gosh, this is just perfect. It's just perfect when it comes to talking about my culture. Because the water literally did connect us all. The water connected species to species. It connected us village to village. It was our place of transportation. It was our way of ceremony. It was a way of being able to show the creator, look, we, we are taking very seriously what you've given to us. And so uh, these photos that I have on here, we, uh, the top picture is our people at Canoe Journey, which means we go from village to village. Right now, that would mean tribe to tribe. So Lower Elwha to Port Gamble to Suquamish, Muckleshoot, all the way up, even into Canada. We would actually pull our canoe, and that thing is really, really heavy, by the way. It takes 14 people to paddle through uh, in the ocean with that thing. Um, but going from place to place, celebrating that water is connecting village to village, family to family. And then the lower photos there are just a little bit of the process of what it takes to make a canoe, to be able to be transported on the water. When we go out there and we want to make a canoe, we find a tree that's usually at least 900 years old. And that cedar tree is harvested, but it is not taken for granted. There's ceremony around that. There's prayer. There's sacrifice. There's offerings. Um, and then we actually take the bark. We will weave that into our beautiful cedar hats. We'll weave it into our cedar mats, and we can use that for for dining, we can use it in cedar clothing. So every piece of that tree is used. And then the massive trunk is then carved into our beautiful canoes. And we're able to use that for transportation. Going from village to village, we can go celebrations, weddings, ceremonies, potlatches, which is partying, a good partying. You know, it's, it's beautiful. And so it's just nice to see this connection of species. Again, we're taking the forest and connecting it to the water. I mentioned the salmon ceremony earlier, and so I'll touch on it here. The salmon ceremony is when we take the first salmon of the season. Usually this is in the early fall, so about September-ish. And we take that first salmon, and we break it up into enough pieces where everyone can have one bite of that salmon's body. We pass it around. We give thanks. We talk about the sacredness of salmon amongst our peoples. We tell stories, good fishing stories, successful fishing stories. And then we take the bones, the head and the tail of that particular salmon that we ate from, and we put it in this beautiful basket, and we lay it on top of cedar boughs. It brings it purity, it brings it cleansing, it brings it honor when we lay it on the cedar branches. And then our people will hand it over from the beach to those who are in the canoe. And then those who are in the canoe, they will paddle out from our shores, and they will find a nice deep place for that salmon, and they will gently lay it back in the water. And it should and it will go back to its own people. And what we ask the salmon to do is we say, when you go back to your people, when you go back to your salmon village, will you tell them that the Nuskayim treated you well, and will you come back to us? And then the salmon does. And that's how we always continually get our salmon seasons back every single year. That's why they come back to the Dungeness River. That's why they come back to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. They don't just stay in Alaska. They don't just stay in Canada. They come back to us because we treated them well. Amazing, isn't that? I love that story. And I love being able to participate in ceremonies like this. 
So what does our relationship look like now? We're in this contemporary era. We have technology, we have sciences, we have data. So what does that mean now for us? And this is the part that I love speaking about, which is this blending of indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge all at the same time, where you have the relationship with the land and the seas and the animals, those brothers and sisters in creation. So that's that indigenous perspective, right? And then you have this Western knowledge perspective that brings all of the study and science. It's amazing. It's in depth. And we need all of that to be able to keep these marine life, this, these brothers and sisters in creation alive, sustaining, and thriving, not only for us to be able to sustain us, but for thriving just for themselves. They need to be able to thrive amongst themselves too. And so at Jamestown, we love being able to have partnerships where we blend these things together. And then you get amazing partnerships. We get to actually, you know, for example, like what, what Melissa was saying earlier, we get to educate our populations on what is the salmon ceremony? Why is the salmon so sacred to us? But then talk about partnerships of study and science on how we can improve our waters for salmon, how we can improve the rivers, make sure that they have enough log jams to be able to swim up and be able to reproduce, things like that. We get to bring these partnerships together, and it's beautiful, and it's necessary, and it's needed especially in times of climate change, for example. I just came from a one-week climate change camp, so I feel really radicalized right now. <laughs> um, but it's good. These are things that I need. Oh, good. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> but these are important. These are important things. I need science and data and study. I need to know that language, and I need to be able to blend it into the language of my people so that those salmon will keep coming back. Yes, ceremony is good. Yes, ceremony is meaningful, but if I don't have the right environment for my salmon to come back, then they won't. So I'm learning about this. You know, I, I'm young in this particular study when it comes to climate and how it affects my animals, my brothers and sisters in creation. But this is where that blending is so important. And I'm almost to the end here, and so I want to uh, leave us with a couple of photos, some quotes, a little more... Um, a little more on my culture here. But these photos here are of Chairman Ron Allen and then my late father, Kurt Grinnell. Chairman Allen is the one who ins Oh, yay. There we go. Thanks. <laughs> oh. They are good men. Very good men. Ron was the one who gave me this particular value, is this coexistence. We have to coexist respectfully and responsibly. And when I heard him say that, it really stuck with me. And I say that every time I can get on a microphone because it's so important. That coexistence is a reality now. We're here together, right now in the cold. <laughs> but, we're here, but we're here and we're coexisting together, right? And we're coexisting in protecting our habitats. We're coexisting in protecting each other. We're coexisting in protecting what is meaningful to us. And we have to be able to do that respectfully and responsibly, and when we do, Everything flourishes, everything thrives. And that includes our marine life. And so there are so many meaningful partnerships that Jamestown has been able to have with FIRO, with, gosh, NOAA, with the University of Washington. We have all of these wonderful partnerships going on on figuring out what does it mean to help our environment, to help our marine life thrive. And so I'll just give you a particular example, which has to do with my dad. Uh, before he passed, he was working with NOAA and University of Washington on net pens. And what does it mean to have net pens? And is there a way to do this that's going to be healthy for the environment and not harmful? A lot of concerns around fish waste. You have a lot of fish in one spot, there's going to be a lot of fish poop. What are we going to do with that? Is there going to be too much nitrogen in the water, too many other chemicals, too many other elements? What are we going to do about that? And so when NOAA and the UW were involved in this project, they were like, oh, Let's talk about carbon dioxide. Kelp absorbs carbon dioxide. We can have plant, or we can plant kelp fields underneath those net pens, and that can help absorb the carbon dioxide from the fish and from its waste. Oh, and by the way, we can also add sea cucumbers. So there comes my friends again, the sea cucumbers. <laughs> you put sea cucumbers underneath the pens, and they can help process all of that fish waste. So we were seeing all of this blending of science and indigenous knowledge coming together, right? These are the types of meaningful partnerships that I'm talking about, and that's that coexistence respectfully and responsibly that Ron is talking about. Now, when it comes to my father, he was all about this. I want to say he was really actually one of the first to talk about climate change projects at Jamestown, and in fact, he created hatcheries because of that as a result. 
But he was always thinking seven generations ahead. So I talked about that earlier, right? Chief Chetsamoka, Chief Chich Mahan, seven generations from him is me. And now all the work that I do, all the work that my dad did, all the work that Chairman Allen is doing, it has to be able to positively affect seven generations from now. If you think about this, too, it's not just me. You are the manifestation of your ancestors seven generations ago. You're standing on their shoulders. I stand on the shoulders of my ancestors. All the work that you're doing now matters. Every decision matters, which can feel like a big burden, but it's a good burden to have. And so all the work that I'm doing is going to carry that spirit on. I want to be able to enjoy the brothers and sisters of creation that live underwater. I want the villages underwater to be able to survive and thrive. I want to be able to say that there are orca people, seal people. You know, I want to be able to say salmon people are always coming back. My children will always be able to taste salmon when they come to the shores and fish. And if I don't do that work, then who's going to do it? So that seven generations value system that my father held is something that I hold very dearly as well. Everything matters. Everything matters. Us being here tonight matters, which I hope inspires you to spend a little money for a good cause. <laughs> right? Everything matters. Everything that you do matters. And so I hope that with that, even if you don't remember the sklalem piece, like ups, ats, thats, remember that we gather with the water. Remember that it's meaningful, that we are brothers and sisters of creation. Remember that we're here to partner, that we're here to make beautiful decisions and beautiful actions for seven generations to be able to absorb and lean on in the future so that they can in turn jump off of what we do. But being able just to think about those beautiful decisions that you're making, and yes, thinking about seven generations from now is a burden. But if we think about water connecting us all, water has been here for thousands of years doing that exact work. The brothers and sisters of creation have been doing that exact work thousands of years, and we can do our part too. And so that's, I think, why we're here tonight, being able to do our part in this beautiful work and to gather here with the water and remembering that water here connects us all. Thank you very much.